Well, welcome to Worship with Westminster. I'm Chris Ward, one of the pastors here, and we are so glad that you have joined us today as we study God's Word together. I hope you had a great 4th of July weekend, uh, enjoyed yourself and are keeping cool in the heat wave that's uh, currently here in south, uh, southern Oregon. Uh, wherever you're at, I uh, hope that you're doing well. Uh, you know, every t uh, 4th of July, I, I think about how uh, our country really does love our freedom, right? But I love the, the way that Scripture approaches the concept of freedom, that we are free, absolutely, we are free in Christ. But as uh, 1 Peter 2 says, we are to live as, uh, well, this is Peter, uh, live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. That we are to love one another, honor everyone, and of course, give our reverence and awe to the one who deserves it above all, our, our incredible loving Father. Uh, so let's actually, as we begin our time together, take a, a moment to turn to God in prayer. Father, you're good, you're loving, you reach out to us with that grace that we can never possibly understand. As we gather, Lord, in your name across distances, at different times even, Lord, unite us. Unite us by your Holy Spirit, reminding us of our identity in Christ, that we are people who display him and your character to our world, to each other, um, always, Lord. Uh, grow that in us even today as we meet in your name. Amen. Well, let's go to God's word together. So have you ever seen that bumper sticker that reads, Jesus is coming, look busy? You know, I, I, the first time I saw it on a car, I have to confess that it, it just made me laugh out loud. But, but then immediately after, I kind of felt a little sad as it really sunk into me what that bumper sticker was saying. I mean, it builds on this kind of toxic view that God is like a grumpy boss, right? Always looking over your shoulder, waiting for you to, to mess up, see if you're doing the right thing or not. And when he does suddenly check in on you, if you're not being good, well, you're going to get fired in a big way. You know, if, if it completely misses, I, I believe, the character of God, who all through Scripture is seen as fundamentally loving and gracious. I mean, sure, the, the bumper sticker gets a laugh. It still gets a laugh from me, but a, a laugh that is kind of at the expense of God's identity. This cartoonish figure of an unhappy boss or policeman looking over our shoulder. Where does that point of view come from? Well, you know, some of it is just a misunderstanding of the nature of judgment that we see in Scripture. I mean, judgment is actually important. Um, we, a world without judgment would, would not be a pretty place. Uh, sometimes it's, it's actually because we, the church, haven't done a good job of communicating God's love and grace to the people around us, that we've actually communicated, in many cases, the judgment, not grace, the, especially the kind of grace that we see in Jesus. And honestly, sometimes this view of God comes from Jesus' own words, as we're going to see in one of today's parables. I mean, Jesus sometimes gives pretty stern warnings in Scripture, and especially when he's talking about the end times or, or of his second coming, his return. I mean, sometimes he, he says things like, woe to you, or watch out, or man, it's going to be hard in that day. Sometimes he comes across as being kind of harsh. I mean, this is true. It's there in Scripture. Although... I would encourage you to pay close attention to the circumstances that surround those harsher words. I mean, when does Jesus speak them and to whom does he speak them? For example, can you think of any time, any circumstance in Scripture in which Jesus really lays into a sinner? I mean, do you ever hear him say, woe to you tax collectors, you're going to pay in the end. Or, or do you ever see him condemn a prostitute or, or tear down a Samaritan or, or a Gentile? I mean, who does he speak his hard words to? And why does he speak them? You usually see him take on the Pharisees, that is the religious elite, and not because of their beliefs, but because of their hypocrisy and their harsh treatment and their exclusion of those sinners. You see Jesus give stern warnings to actually his own disciples. He's actually very gracious and gentle with sinners, a little harder on those who claim to be the religious elite. 
You know, when I was, I was studying preaching in seminary, I remember our professor saying to us, you know, students, that our job as preachers was to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. Uh, actually, I think that quote was originally applied to newspapers, but it definitely fits the pulpit as well. In a sense, that's also what we see Jesus doing pretty regularly, right? Gentle with the world, harder with those who claim influence within God's own people. Gentle with the sinners, hoping to bring them back to healing, back to righteousness. Hard on those who are self-righteous. Which then gives us our setting for our parables today. You know, over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at parables that are focused on the things to come. That is, eschatological is the, the fancy word for it. But uh, parables about Jesus' second coming. These parables often complain, uh, contain pretty stern warnings, uh, but notice that these parables are also almost always spoken directly to his disciples. This is an in-house conversation. These challenges are not generally given to the whole world, although obviously the, the topic is important for the whole world, but the warnings are given to his own disciples to encourage them to live lives of integrity and faithfulness. And, of course, perseverance, which is actually what one of our Greek words today means. You know, today we're going to look at a few short parables that are warnings specifically to his disciples. He actually starts out pretty, pretty kindly, pretty nice and generously, and then there are a couple of, of warnings that come after that. We'll, we'll get into that in a minute. But to put it in setting, um, this, uh, parables, or these parables are, are told shortly after Jesus told the parable of the rich fool, which we looked at a few weeks ago, right, where he says, don't put your trust in these things because you don't know at what point in time you're going to be asked to give account for those things. Remember that that parable, he spoke to the whole crowd because it was a request or responding to a request from someone within the crowd. But then the scripture goes on to say he, he kind of pulls us aside and has a private conversation with specifically his disciples, encouraging them, first of all, to put their trust in God because God, he says, knows their needs and God's going to take care of you. He says, fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. I mean, trust God. He says, God is enough for you. He is your treasure. And then building on that foundation of a, of a good and loving and generous God who provides for us, who's even going to give us his kingdom, he says, building on that foundation, we then have today's parables. So God is good. God is enough. Therefore, the parables that come next. From Luke chapter 12, verses 35 to 48, as Jesus, again, is speaking directly to his disciples, that means he's also speaking directly to us, his disciples. As always, listen for God's voice speaking to you as you hear his word. So from Luke chapter 12, uh, starting at verse 35. Stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning and be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at table and he will come and serve them. If he comes in the second watch or in the third and finds them awake, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Peter said, Lord, are, are you telling this parable for us or for all? The Lord said, who then is the faithful and wise manager? whom his master will set over his household to give them their portion of food at the proper time. Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that servant says to himself, my master is delayed in coming, and he begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and get drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he does not know and will cut him in pieces and put him with the unfaithful. And that servant 
who knew his master's will but did not get ready or act according to his will will receive a severe beating. But the one who did not know and did what deserved a beating will, he will receive a light beating. Everyone to whom much was given, of him much will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. This is God's word for us. Amen. So, interesting passage there. Starts pretty nice, ends kind of hard. What's going on here? Well, it's about anticipation and expectation and our response to the coming master. So, let me just give you an example. Adding a child to your family is generally considered speaking, you know, generally speaking, a joyful thing, right? It's something that you don't just wait for. It's something that you anticipate, right? So what's the difference between waiting and anticipating? Well, waiting in the doctor's office or waiting at the DMV or waiting in the grocery store line, how would you describe that kind of waiting? It's just waiting, right? In fact, it might be waiting with boredom or even with impatience or even sometimes with dread, you know, am I gonna pass the test? But let's say that you're, you're at a concert house waiting for your favorite performance to begin. Or you're an expectant parent waiting for your child to come. That's, that's a different kind of waiting, right? That's anticipation. You're looking forward to something good that's coming. Now, Jesus starts this parable by talking about not just waiting, but anticipation, an expectant kind of waiting, because something really good is coming. You know, uh, for uh, my family, we've obviously added four children to our family, three through the adoption process and one biological. So the adoption process, which we experienced first with our first daughter, Imani, um, it was very orderly and planned. I mean, there's lots of scheduling going on. There's scheduled home visits, there's background checks, there's parenting classes, there's paperwork, lots and lots and lots of paperwork. And then when the time comes, you board the airplane and you travel to meet your child and then you return at the scheduled time. It's all very orderly and very planned. Not always very easy, but very planned. Our experience with the birthing process for our biological son, Andrew, not so orderly and planned. I mean, we, we thought we had it all planned. We, we were working on it. And then suddenly, surprise, all our planning went out the window. It was just a little over 21 years ago, and we were still living in Pittsburgh, uh, although that we had made this connection with this church in Medford, Oregon, and we thought that this was going to be the place that we were going to end up at, that we were going to be the right fit, but there were still some details, final details that had to be worked out, and part of those final details was the timing because Julie was pregnant and due in early July. And we thought we were getting ready. I mean, we were in a parenting class. We were, you know, starting to get the rooms ready and getting all, the, you know, doing all that parent, pre-parenting stuff. We thought we still had time. And then it was a, a Saturday in early June, right? Still weeks to go. Just an ordinary day, Julie and I, um, it was a Saturday in early June. Uh, uh, I did some work on a Sunday school class that I'd be teaching the next morning. And then we took our little toddler Imani out for a, a walk at the Pittsburgh Zoo and, and went out for Italian food after that. And then we were looking forward to Julie's baby shower uh, Sunday afternoon the next day. And we went to bed with all our plans in order. Suddenly in the middle of the night, Julie's waking me up, my water just broke, and we're scrambling to find the car keys to throw a few things in a bag. You know, what, what was it that we needed to take with us? I can't remember. We didn't have a go bag because we, we thought we had weeks to, to go still to put it together. We, we hadn't even finished our birthing class. We'd taken a couple classes, but we hadn't gotten to this part yet, right? And this, this baby, though, was coming like it or not. So we're running here and there, and I'm running back to the bedroom because I realized that maybe pants would be a good idea to go to the hospital in, and we finally get into the the car. Oh, wait a second. What, what do we do with our, th our three-year-old? Who can we call at 1 a.m., right? F uh, finally, we're in the car on the way to the hospital. Now we have to remember, how do we get to the hospital? And just this kind of sense of panic. We were not ready. I mean, honestly, a lot of that night for me is a blur. We, we thought we were ready. We were anticipating his coming. This was going to be a joyful thing. And suddenly, <gasps> it's here, and we have no idea what we're doing. This is a joyful occurrence but one we were completely un unprepared for, and that added a little stress at least f at, at first. Right? Jesus says his coming, it's gonna be a lot like that. I mean, you're looking forward to it. It's gonna be great. It's a surprise. It's a wonderful surprise, an anticipated surprise even, but it's gonna be unexpected. How do you prepare for the unexpected? 
You know, look at the beginning of this, this passage. Jesus says, stay dressed for action. Keep your lamps burning. Literally, the, the Greek says, gird your loins, which is kind of an out-of-date, uh, obviously, saying for us. It doesn't make any sense to us. It was actually a reference to the Passover feast. So God told the, the Israelites uh, at that first Passover, well, they were still slaves in, in Egypt, that they had to gird their loins. That is, they had to take up their robes, their long, flowing robes, which is what you wear in the desert, uh, but it's really hard to move in a long flowing robe. And so if you need to move quickly, you have to take the bottom up of the hem and you have to tuck it into your belt to free up your legs for, for action, right? So prepare yourself for action, he says. We might say today, get your shoes on, be ready to go. Get your go bag, get ready. Jesus wants them to be ready. He says, for what? Well, then he tells the first parable. What are we getting ready for? It's about a master who says he goes away. It's a common theme in Jesus' parables, the master who goes away and leaves trusted servants in charge of his things to await his return. Now, why is the master gone? Well, he's gone to a feast. In fact, he's gone to a grand wedding banquet. Again, another theme in, in Jesus' teachings. This grand wedding banquet, which we've talked about before. It only it appears that while the master gets to go to this banquet, well, the servants aren't invited. They're not part of it. They can only imagine what the master might be enjoying, what kind of joy and satisfaction, what kind of celebration, the music, the dancing, the delicacies, the wine. They can only imagine what this celebration that those others get to participate in might be like. They anticipate their master's return, and he'll probably tell them all about it. Only what happens next in this story? Well, we read the master comes home, except that the, the Greek word for coming home isn't actually to come home or to return. It actually implies or, or says that the master withdraws from the feast, which is an implication that the feast is actually still going on. But the master leaves the feast early. Why? What's he doing? What's he up to? Well, because it turns out that the master returns home with trays laden with food from the feast itself. And that the master knocks on the door and they open it and he comes in and he tucks his own robe in and gets ready for action. And he begins to serve his servants. I mean, this is all startling stuff, especially in that culture. But for anyone, can you imagine the servant, the leader serving the, the, the followers, the servant? I mean, the, the master serving the servants. Actually, this is something we see all the time with Jesus. I mean, Jesus washes his disciples' feet, right? He serves them at the table. This master in Jesus' story prepares himself for action, and then he serves his servants. He's a serving master. This is who God is. It's a reflection of God's character all through Scripture that our God is a serving, nurturing God of love and grace who takes care of his people. He's a beloved God who, beloved, who loves his people, takes care of his beloved people. It's a picture of generosity and grace. I mean, Jesus says, this is, this is what's going to happen. You don't know when it's going to happen. But at some point in time, the Son of Man's going to return. And he's going to bring you to a feast. The master's going to return like a thief, unexpectedly. Again, it's anticipated but unexpected. But what he brings is the feast. He's coming back for good. This is good stuff. I mean, so far, so good, right? This is a pretty good scripture. It's a great picture. He's going to come and everything's going to be good and we're going to be invited into the feast. You don't know when it's going to happen, but it's going to happen. It's guaranteed to happen. Then Peter asks a kind of a follow-up clarifying question and, and Jesus' stories take a turn. And I, I have to ask myself as I read the scripture, Why? What was it that sets Jesus off? And Peter says this, Lord, are you telling this parable for us or for all? Again, what was that first parable about? It was about being invited to the feast, the celebration. Is this for us or is it for all? Are we the special ones alone or does this apply to those people too? At least that's how I read Peter's question here. And how does Jesus respond? I don't know, Peter. You tell me. Who then is the faithful and wise manager 
Is it the servant who continues to serve and specifically serves his fellow servants even, provides food for the others at the proper time? The one who reflects the kind of character that's seen in the master, the master who himself serves the servants? Is this the kind of faithful master, a faithful servant, manager? But Peter, if you think you're too special to serve another, if you think you're too good to, to, to provide for those people, if, if you think you can take the trust that the master gives you and use it only to further yourself, then you've missed it. You've missed it, and you're going to be cut to pieces. You're cut off. Take this seriously. Admittedly, Jesus' words get pretty harsh here, but remember, Jesus really only gets harsh when love is on the line and when people are being hurt, devalued, dehumanized, excluded, and especially when it's done by those who claim to be in a special relationship with God. Those who say they represent God and then treat others like dirt. Jesus says, that's not, that's not going to happen. We can't put up with that. I mean, have you ever worked with a coworker who really only worked when the boss was around? Right? They would try time, to time it perfectly so that they could get the credit even though they didn't necessarily do all the work. I mean, their heart just wasn't in it, right? They, they were working for their paycheck. Have you ever worked with somebody like that? What it feels like? That, you know that that person has no value for what their boss actually values. They're not doing it for that. They're just doing it for the paycheck. And Jesus says that kind of attitude, that's not going to fly in God's kingdom. You cannot just work for the paycheck as if somehow the master doesn't know what you were doing before he returned. Right? God knows and that kind of attitude is not what we're about. So how do you prepare for this surprise, for the return of Jesus? Well, Jesus says it's by being that which you need to be. Right? It's not about the activity or timing the activity even. It's about identity. It's about who you are. This is integrity, right? Having one's will aligned with the will of the master, with the will of God. You love your fellow servants, not to get credit for it, but because obviously the master loves them. I mean, if the master's going to come back and serve the servants, then why wouldn't the servant serve the servants, if that makes sense? I mean, the servant who in this story begins to abuse the fellow servants, who uses the freedom given to the, him for, and the authority that's been given to him to trample over others and serve only himself, is obviously dis departed from the master's will. He's not really the servant. He thinks he's the master, at least for the moment. He's never valued what the master actually values. It's not just about his actions. It's actually about the heart from which the actions flow. You know, those of us who truly follow Jesus, we all know that we need a heartectomy. Right? We need a new heart to replace our selfish hearts. It's so easy for us as human beings to be self-centered. And Jesus says, you got to remove that hardened heart and, and, and have my heart. That our identities need to be replaced with the heart of Jesus. The same gracious, generous heart that beats with love for this world. Our self-identity cannot be what it was before. It can never be the same. You know, Gerard Manley Hopkins was one of the greatest English poets of the Victorian era. Several years ago, I ran across one of his poems uh, entitled, As Kingfishers Catch Fire. It's a short poem. I'm not going to read the whole thing, even though it's not that long. Uh, it's pretty flowery. But, but this, this part, I think, says so beautifully how being a Christian is different from other people and even other living beings. So listen to what uh, Hopkins writes. He writes this. Each mortal thing does one thing and the same, deals out that being indoors that each one dwells, selves, goes itself. Myself it speaks in spells, crying, what I do is me, for that I came. So far it makes sense, right? Even if it's kind of flowery. That we are naturally ourselves, except that he goes on to say, it's not so for those who are in Christ. Listen to what he writes next. I say more. The just man justices, keeps grace that keeps all his goings graces, 
acts in God's eye what in God's eye he is, Christ. For Christ plays in 10,000 places, lovely in limbs and lovely in eyes not his, to the Father through the features of men's faces. In other words, you are not to just be yourself. Our world says, be yourself. For the Christian, we have a different calling. We are not to be just ourselves. We are to be ourselves soaked in Christ. We are to be, in essence, Christ to one another. That's what Christian means, little Christs. You represent Christ. If you follow Christ, you have to be like Christ. You treat others like Christ treats others. Christ is meant to shine through our faces, our limbs, our eyes, displaying not only just to the world, Christ, but even to the Father as an act of worship, displaying to the Father himself the picture we were meant to be. Made in the image of God, we display Christ. When we serve, even our fellow servants, we display Christ. Blessed is this servant. You know, Jesus asks us to take this seriously, to be fully what we were meant to be. That no matter when he comes, when he comes, and it's going to be a surprise, and we can anticipate that coming, but when he comes, he will see that lovely image of love displayed in us that we will look just like him because always we are striving to be like him. You know, this parable ends on a harsh note because Jesus wants us, his disciples, who he's speaking to, to take this seriously. This is not a game. This is a calling to be reflections of that master's heart who longs to bring the feast and have us experience his joy and enter into that joy. And we are privileged to be set in a position where we are the ones who get to give it. We have to give it, or else we're not really servants. Let's pray. Father, your grace, your love given through your son, Jesus Christ, is so beautiful. May this, Lord, be what we strive not just to do, but who we are. That we strive for our identity to be shaped by who you are and so naturally reflect you to the world. We pray all of this in the name of Christ. Amen. Greatest love that anyone could ever know That overcame the cross and grave to find my soul Until I see you face to face And grace amazing takes me home I'll trust in you With all I am I live to see your kingdom come Yeah.
You know, I don't think that fear was ever meant to be uh, the good way to move God's disciples. Uh, Jesus isn't trying to make us afraid, but he does want us to take seriously the calling that he's given us, that we are people of grace and we can't live any different. Uh, so whatever it is in Peter's question that sets him off, I think that's something for us to ponder as well. Are we people who are led by grace, who, who do this just because we love God so much that we are willing to serve one another, uh, to sacrifice for the sake of this world because that's who God is? Um, may, may God be with you this week as you seek to live him out well. God bless you. We'll see you next time.